It is Transfiguration Sunday, leading up to Lent. And Pastor Karen has chosen also to make this a Sunday honoring the transformative power of music. And so we have a scripture for each of those purposes today. First from Psalm 98. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And from Luke 9, the, trans the transfiguration. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen listen to him and when the voice had spoken jesus was alone and they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen here ends this morning's readings good morning <clears throat> and thank you to all these musicians and all the work scurrying to fill in or Marianne today, change plans, uh, that kind of thing. And that's, that's a wonderful church that works together to do that. And some of you with your beautiful voices and many skills uh, make that possible. So blessings on all of you. Today's Transfiguration Sunday, which the Sunday which brings Epiphany to a close and ushers in the season of Lent. Each year we read one of the gospel versions on this occurrence. Each is a little different, and each year I attempt to speak about it. You have heard a lot of my transfiguration sermons by this time, many of you. I've learned much over the years by doing this. I've struggled with various elements of the story. Let me think of a few just off the top of my head. One, one way of looking at it was, what happens when you come back down the mountain? Another way is, why don't you tell anyone? Another one is, what's the miracle here? Um, another is the, the nature of light, the whole notion of transformation. There's probably many more, but today I just went out on a limb and uh, I struggled with various elements uh, and about the story and what it's saying about the divine and human nature, about heaven and earth. And of course, as all biblical stories, there's never just one meaning, but many that can emerge. I hope one of these years I have caught the most important. There are many layers of meaning for each message that's brought at the same time. Today, as we contemplate the transfiguration of Christ that was described in today's passage, I would like to explore the experience of music as spiritual expression and as a transfiguring medium of the sacred. The spiritual world and the physical world are not separate, not separate one from another, as many mistakenly assume. They are the medium 
focus on that just a little bit. It'll make sense as I go. They are the medium and the manifestation of one another. In playing or listening to beautiful music, the body, the mind, and the spirit unite. Music can become a medium of the divine spirit touching our spirits. It is breath, giving breath. Music inspires. How about that word, inspires? It comes from the Latin word inspiritus, which means to, to breathe into, to blow air into. Hence, we have these black uh, duck masks that the choir wears so we can blow, blow that air into the world, but not too far during COVID. Music has always been a central element of worship. Isn't that interesting? We don't go to work and sing songs, right? Well, some of us do. Um, we, don't, we don't go to the store and do commerce singing, but we sing in church. What's that about? Music is a medium of the spirit. It's always been a central element of worship because it contains the movement of the spirit in our interior lives, something deep within. It embodies the qualities of our human experience in this movement. The passion of triumph and grief, the joy and sorrow, the love, the praise, the memories, the dreams. She ever, Patty sent me the words to the song she sang for the call to worship this morning uh, before I heard the music. But when it's set to music, it's like all of a sudden, oh my goodness, that's a power that the words don't contain, even though the words are part of the experience, their expression of the music as well. The word movement is used as a musical term to refer to a portion of a musical composition which has its own key or mood and then resolves itself or segues through the movement into another key. That's about all I know about music. <laughs> this is the movement of life as well, isn't it? Life also has its harmony and its discord, its change of mood and tone and pace and tempo and rhythm. In music, as in life, there is both clear structure and wild freedom. Now, it's easier to see in the musical arts the power of structure than it is in the graphic arts or in the whatever you call, but there are structures to, uh, what do you call it when you paint on paper or you oil paint? The visual arts, visual arts. You don't see that structure as clearly as in music. It's mathematical. There's a real clear structure in music, but even within that structure, there's a wild freedom of expression. Structure and freedom are woven together. The expected and the unexpected create drama as they dance together. There's joy and suffering, there's eros and pathos, there's repetition. Ridiculous repetition at times, isn't it? The chanting, the same, the same, the same, or even in our words today, holy, 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 because we're not meant to be thinking too much right then. We're meant to be feeling the, the awesomeness of the moment. A musician, as any artist, has the creative task of joining matter and spirit. He or she doesn't create this union of matter and spirit. It already exists, but he or she uncovers it. When successful, the music reaches far beyond the musician to the heart of the listener. The musical arts uncover the sacred using sound and rhythm. Music is arranged by way of tempo and pitch, melody and harmony, and their dynamics reverberate into the matter of the human body through the ear and into the human soul and spirit in more mysterious and uniquely different ways. The spiritual soulful artistry of music also meets, mu meets a matter in the shape and nature of the instruments that you play, ah, that we blow into all these interesting shapes and ways that we play music around the world. The keys we play, the wind instruments, the string instruments, or on which the music, or the notes on the musical staff are another way that that's a very tangible look at music, but it isn't music, is it? 
or the lighted screen, acoustics of the room in which one uh, sings or plays, the nature of the audience itself. In today's story from the gospel, Jesus' garments become, are transfigured and become whiter than snow. In the Old Testament, when Moses is given the Ten Commandments, what happens there? His face radiates with light so bright that he must put on a veil. The spiritual source of the sacred flame ignites the prophet, the Christ, and in today's context, the musician, and the listener to carry and hold the divine in sound or sight. As human beings, we all have this creative potential. We all have access to the transfiguration, whether phys physicist or poet, child or parent, teacher or student, healer or public figure. And as we look at the news lately, we wish public figures and leaders had a little bit more of this sense of the holy structure of life, don't we? When a human being as artist connects to this spirit, he or she becomes fundamentally changed. And the connection isn't always a pleasant one. In fact, it can be initially disturbing and disorienting to the human soul. You know what I'm getting at here? It can lead to madness. Have you ever considered how many artists, whether painters or writers or musicians or Poets are vulnerable to a kind of madness. Can you got anybody name any right now? I was going to go back and, and think about that. Yeah. Exactly. Vincent van Gogh. Anybody else? Just off the top of your head. There's a lot. Kurt Who? Kurt oh, yes. Oh, yes. In the rock field for sure, right? Oh. Rebel. Many poets I know reading about uh, Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath took her life. You know, there's, there, it's a dangerous, dangerous movement toward the holy sometimes. If like most of us, the artist as a human being lives with little awareness of their divine source, and then somehow in their act of creation begins to tap into it, they're awakening to a presence of such intimacy and intensity can be uncomfortably disorienting. Do you know, somebody asked me this week who was confessing some things uh, as a pastor, um, I just thought of that. They directly asked me, do you think I'm mad? And I'm like, no, no. But we all kind of want to check that out, don't we? Is how we think or feel really okay? If we can, ex it can expose one to a wildness and chaos, even to the point of questioning his or her sanity. But transfiguration is the work of God. When a seeker in a creation of art or music preserves through the anguish of, perseveres through the anguish of uncertainty and allows a stream of divine, divine creativity to flow through him or her, the creation which emerges resonates with God. It joins this world to the next. Music can provide a powerful experience of the divine in a way very little else can. As Ludwig van Beethoven once wrote, music is the mediator between the spiritual and the sensual life. Music is a higher revelation than all wisdom and philosophy. Each time we come to worship, music invites us to invoke the spirit of God into this sanctuary, into this place of silence and stillness. And we, like the disciples witnessing the transfiguration of Christ, are invited by God's grace to witness transformation, a transformation of our own hearts and souls. I recently read a quote by a man named Yip Harbour. Anybody know what he wrote? The lyrics to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. He said, music makes you feel feelings, lyrics make you think thoughts, and songs make you feel thoughts. In her book, A Singing Faith, hymn writer Jane Parker Huber or Huber, Huber, I think, 
Duber, clearly understands the power of words we sing, which make us feel thoughts. She begins her book with about hymns, uh, on hymns, her book of hymns, with this understanding. Faith is meant to be sung, and hymns are for the singing of it. Some say that hymns are a far greater influence on one's personal theology than even scripture or teaching or preaching or family or friends. With psalms and chants, chorales and canons, <laughs> spirituals and choruses, hymns and Appalachian folk songs, we have sung our faith. Words that are sung, especially if they're sung repeatedly and enthusiastically. Holy, holy, we had to, what do you call it when you get louder? Crescendo. Crescendo. We had to really crescendo into that holy, holy, holy. They work their way into our subconscious and shape us in subtle ways, as well as giving us words and phrases that come quickly to mind when we ponder or articulate our faith. Think about that one a little bit, because that has a lot to do with inclusive language and more modern references to things without losing the passion and the tradition of, of, of our roots. The words we sing in our songs with the music we know and love allow us to feel our thoughts. But music impacts us emotionally, even without the expression of thought. As Harburg said, music makes you feel feelings, the music itself. One, and I, if I've told this, pardon me, I know I've told some of you personally, but it was a really important memory for me. One powerful memory for me as a young mother was seeing this feeling response to music in my infant child. The family was traveling by car to visit family. Our daughters were in the back seat, Eliza about six and Sophie around two, sitting in her car seat. We turned on the radio to a station that played classical music, which wasn't common for us, but it makes us sound real <laughs> highfalutin, doesn't it? The song playing was rather soft and touching. Everyone was sitting quiet, and I turned around to look, on, look at them, check on them, and I saw tears streaming down Sophie's face. She didn't appear to be sad or upset. Her face was calm, but she was obviously moved by something too young to be conscious of what, but clearly feeling it and experiencing it bodily. Sophie as an infant felt the tenor or the mood of the music without any context in thought. I'm told that there's something on Facebook or uh, on YouTube, YouTube, I guess, where an infant is responding to her mother singing to her. Does has anybody heard that? I didn't have a chance to look it up, but my daughter, when I told my daughter about this, she told me. The sheer beauty of music moves us, transfigures us to feel reverence for the mystery of the spirit behind it. In his book, Beauty, the Invisible Embrace, the late Celtic priest John O'Donohue from Connemara, Ireland, spoke to the transfiguring power of the, in the presence of the beautiful in this life. Beautiful music, beautiful art, beautiful emotion between two of us, a beautiful being, a beautiful child, nature. When we awaken to call of beauty, we become aware of new ways of being in the world. Though beauty only visits us and will not linger, neither did the transfiguration, it calls us to feel and think and act with more gracefulness in the world and to create and live a life that awakens the beautiful. The wonder of the beautiful is its ability to surprise us. With swift, sheer grace, it is like a divine breath that blows the heart open. Beauty is not a call to growth only. It's a transforming presence wherein we unfold toward growth almost before we realize it. So, to conclude, music has the power to transfigure the moment and the person living in this moment. When we're surprised by a sudden experience of the beautiful in nature or art or music, we are called forth in that moment, and this is my favorite line, and I wrote it, okay, but to see, to see a blessed order to the things of earth and heaven, to see a blessed order to the things of earth and heaven. I think so many of us are having a real hard time with that after two years of COVID and invading 
a country, you know, uh, you know, one sovereign state invading another and the things that we see. And we're like, is there any order to this? The transfiguration of Jesus was a call of beauty for the disciples who witnessed it. The call of beauty visited them fleetingly and unexpectedly. And yet his voice called out to them in a way that would forever change their lives.